All right. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, hopefully, you can see my screen and everything's good here. Um, my name is Steve Wilson. I'm uh, hosting the webinar today for environmental health professionals on what you need to know about wells. Uh, this certainly is an exhaustive webinar, um, especially gauging by the questions we received. Um, a number are more geared toward um, a well contractor, uh, which I am not. And so um, we'll talk about that later. But um, I do want to welcome everyone. And um, it looks like we're going, everything's set up. So um, I'm with the State Water Survey at the University of Illinois. Um, the water survey is like a state geological survey. Uh, in most states, we're fortunate in Illinois to have both the State Water Survey and the State Geological Survey. And I also want to mention that this program, the Private Well Class, uh, which hosts these webinars, is part of a program uh, jointly ran with the Rural Community Assistance Partnership, and um, it's funded by US EPA uh, as a source water protection program. So um, let's get started. First thing, um, if you are a NEHA CEU um, capable EHP, um, you should know that if you took this webinar on any of the dates that are down in the lower right corner, uh, the last one was in November, um, you're not eligible for this same webinar except once every two years for your credentialing. And so if you've taken the same course, which uh, the CHP webinar, uh, the difference is the uh, questions at the end are different, but really the core content and most of the slides are, are very similar and it's the same type of material. So um, if you do want CEUs, um, we can provide the certificate of attendance, a copy of the slide deck and the completed NEHA forms, which uh, we will discuss there also, there's two handouts on your GoToWebinar little screen thing down below um, where you ask questions and then it says handouts and there's a chat. Um, you can download those uh, to get started. So um, as I mentioned, the Rural Community Assistance Partnership is our partner in this program. And I want to mention what RCAP does and is because as an EHP, um, there are folks who are in every state and uh, you might be able to rely on uh, for information or support uh, with your private well program or uh, when you have a challenging well or an issue uh, that a well owner uh, needs help with. So uh, there are six regional RCAP affiliates. They're all independent nonprofits. They're, they're shown here, and these are the states they represent. Um, you can contact us or me directly, and I can get you a contact uh, for wherever you're at in the country. Um, the, the RCAP part of this program is the boots on the ground part. They put on um, workshops for sanitarians as well as for well owners. They also um, go out and do individual one-on-one -on -one assessments of wells um, with an assessment tool we developed um, with a group of professionals. And they've done over 1,800 of those around the country. So um, they have a lot of wherewithal on practical issues related to private wells, and when you run into a specific situation, uh, there's someone you can lean on uh, in your state. Okay, uh, so a little bit about the water survey, just to give you a background. Uh, you know, even people in Illinois, a lot of people uh, don't know what the water survey is or does. Um, even my uncle used to still still ask me if I worked for the water company, which I don't. Um, but the water survey was formed in the 1890s because of cholera and typhoid problems. And um, it was formed through our state legislature. And so we've been around well over 100 years. We have a public service lab, which Dan is on the call, um, is, runs our lab. And we also house all the state's well records. So we do a lot of services for the communities in our state as well as private well owners. But well owners can call us. We can give them information about water quality because of the almost 30,000 samples we've collected over the years uh, in the state of Illinois. And it allows us to be basically the groundwater and well experts for the state uh, to help communities with their water supply and water quality issues as well. Um, as an example, this is um, from our files. We have a community files for every town uh, that uses groundwater in the state. And uh, this is from 1916. It's a map of a typhoid outbreak in Pena. And water survey uh, staff at the time uh, researched this problem found out uh, in the end it ended up being a problem with the Pena Ice Cream Company, uh, which caused this particular outbreak. So there are tons of really, uh, I will call cool, uh, old records in our files. 
and um, we're in the process of digitizing all those or have been for the last nine months or so which is uh, where we came across this but it's you know this you can't make this stuff up it's it talks about uh, it really is a great example of the history we have in the state of Illinois of providing services uh, to uh, our citizens related to groundwater and wells and water quality so today's webinar as I mentioned was part of the national program through RCAP and it's jointly between us and I mentioned the National Environmental Health Association here um, they are also a partner on our uh, in our grant with EPA and provide our private well class which is a 10 lesson class that anyone can take online um, if you're a well owner you can go to our website and sign up for it and it sends you a PDF once a, a week for 10 weeks each of the 10 lessons if you're a sanitarian and you want CEU credit for NEHA through it you go to NEHA's website and they have a version of our class that's free to take and it provides one CEU for each of the 10 lessons and again uh, EPA funds this whole program uh, so um, we're really appreciative of you know the ability for of us to do this work nationally uh, is only because of those sources um, it, it, this is being recorded as are all our webinars and you can find them on privatewellclass.org under slash videos uh, there's a some a list on the right you can click on past webinars and you can see every webinar we've done in the last four or five years so and again I'll point out that the cool part about those is even if you go to all the EHP webinars we've done uh, maybe there's eight of those over the last four years um, if you go to the back half of the, each of those videos you'll get to questions that are likely different or at least some are different so um, and if you have a question today um, we don't get to your question which there were you know 80 or 90 questions among the people who registered today so we certainly can't get to all those um, but if you have a question based on something I've said today um, go to the chat box or the question box on your go to webinar uh, part of the screen and you can type it in there uh, Katie Buckley is monitoring that and we'll have a list of those up and uh, I will yeah um, it'll okay so uh, mentioning our staff here I'm, I'm a groundwater hydrologist I'm presenting today um, and Katie Buckley is a, our outreach specialist who is going to take your questions and we'll work with uh, anyone who needs CEU information at the end and Dan, Dan Webb is also on the call he's the head of our public service lab which until 2006 any well owner in Illinois could get a free water sample uh, from our lab for inorganics and metals which was a really cool service that was taxpayer funded and it's still a really good deal today um, it's well over 20 constituents and I think it costs 50 or 60 dollars um, so it's you know still subsidized by the state which uh, gives well owners an opportunity to learn more about their water quality um, what we're going to talk about today uh, since this webinar is really geared towards environmental health professionals it's the challenges we face and the issues um, with well owners their attitudes um, why they don't test all those things as well as some basics of groundwater and wells we find that um, given the state, um, which state you're in, um, some states have a much more wherewithal related to wells and groundwater than other states regarding their environmental health professionals. And that's just because of the focus of the county or the local health districts and what their requirements and mandates are. And so in some states, uh, there's a lot of wherewithal related to wells and there's folks who could probably give this webinar just as well as I can in other states not so much and so we're trying to cover some of the basics so you understand some of those uh, basic issues related to wells um, I'm also going to talk about uh, groundwater and health professionals and why we all need to work together I'm not a health professional um, and as health professionals it's important for you to understand why you need to have some groundwater professionals on your team as you uh, work with well owners and, and work through uh, any kind of uh, private well program and then at the end I'll talk a little bit about our private well class and some of the resources that are available to use an environmental health professional to share with the well owners you serve okay so there's really lots of issues out there you know the, the flavor of the day is, is uh, PFAS um, but before that it was lead and before that it was chrome uh, 6 and you know there's there's going to be a next PFAS probably in a year or two who knows um, but there's we're always going to find things that we've done uh, as a society that uh, harm our environment and and risk our public health and really it comes down to public health protection source water protection protecting the groundwater we plan to use in the future and just overall water quality and so um, all those other things um, come and go depending on what's happened 
so for instance, you know, there was a drought in California for a number of years and a lot of wells got lowered. Um, the flooding in Texas and Florida we've seen uh, from the hurricanes the last few years have really done a lot to encourage uh, environmental response and uh, private well testing and some of those things. Uh, also this, you know, the contamination issues I mentioned and, and the issue of non-regulated drinking water, I throw that out there. Um, you know, there's some groups that talk about private wells being non-regulated drinking water systems. And while that is definitely the case in 98% of the country, um, many places that's by choice. Uh, a lot of private well owners don't want the government involved in uh, monitoring their well or telling them how to keep their well or, you know, whatever. So uh, they are non-regulated, but it isn't a buzzword that should be used to alarm everyone. Uh, we have, you know, over 17 million private wells in the country, 42 million people, it's estimated, and a lot of those folks want to have a private well. So the challenges we face, uh, especially when you look at this nationally, are the differences we see between states and the rules they have. So even the definition of a private well, whether it has to be permitted or whether logs have to be submitted, you know, I say here, New Jersey and Pennsylvania, uh, nearly 20 years ago, New Jersey passed a law that requires um, any time a home is sold or a property sold with a well on it, uh, that the state lab has to come out and collect a sample. I believe it costs about $600. The results only go to the buyer and seller. They have to decide who's going to pay that. But because of that, they get almost 13,000 water quality samples a year. And over 20 years, you can imagine they know everything there is to know about the groundwater in their state. You know, as a scientist, I'd love to have that kind of data. Um, and New Jersey certainly smaller than Illinois. But on the contrasting side, we have states that um, aren't as progressive or for whatever reason their state hasn't been able to pass the rules they want to pass. And Pennsylvania is one of those. They don't have well construction code, nor do they license drillers. And um, what's interesting in Pennsylvania is what that's led to is a lot of grassroots efforts in that state to protect their groundwater and to um, deal with private well issues. We just held a private well conference actually in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania last week. And our first speaker was a, a gentleman who's a groundwater hydrologist who talked about a local ordinance they developed to protect their watershed and their groundwater. And so there's, it's caused kind of an upwelling in the state uh, because the state can't get their work done that in a lot of local places uh, they've developed their own uh, rules and ways of protecting uh, their groundwater and wells. And, you know, the last bullet there says, especially in enforcing the rules they have. I run into states um, and, or counties or, or local districts a lot of times where, you know, a driller is supposed to submit a log, but no one enforces that or some other rule um, that's in place that, yeah, the rule's there, but no one really follows it. And it's a matter of having the resources. Some states do, some states don't. They make different priorities. And so we see a variety of different things um, around the country. Uh, another one I use as an example a lot is Mississippi. Um, they don't require logs to be filed for wells that are, I believe, five inches in diameter or smaller. So um, all the private wells are mostly five inches or smaller, and they have very few well logs uh, for where their private wells are in the country. So. Um, and the other pieces of this, ground, our county health departments or local health departments aren't always adequately trained. We've had a lot of EHPs contact us after taking our class and say, hey, I wish this was available when I started my job. You know, I'm, I'm supposed to be inspecting wells, but I really know nothing about them. And that's one of the reasons why NEHA is a great partner in that, um, you know, I know from going to the NEHA conference every year, five or six years ago, there were maybe two talks about wells and, and those issues. And I know at the conference this year coming up in Nashville, um, I think it's Nashville, there are, uh, there's an entire day uh, devoted to, uh, there's a whole track uh, devoted to private well and private water systems. So uh, things are changing, but uh, that's one of the issues we see uh, typically, especially on the local level. Um, and what that leads to is very unorganized and local approaches to support. So you see these really great uh, areas where someone's taken up the challenge and maybe creating an ordinance for their county or their local health district where the county or district next to them um, has no rules whatsoever. And so, you know, it's, it's uh, the best way for me to put that, uh, borrowing from someone at EPA who talked about uh, one of the drinking water rules in the push a number of years ago uh, to have unequal rules in different parts of the country 
is it doesn't provide equal health protection. And there's no reason why someone who uh, lives in a particular house that has a certain set of rules that protect their health should have to should move to some place and not have the same level of protection and ensure the, the health of their family and that sort of thing. So we need to start looking at this on a bigger scale and trying to uh, standardize and at least raise awareness so that uh, those things can happen. So um, really to me, um, and it comes down to these issues. You know, like I said, there's all kinds of issues that pop up. PFAS is the current one. But what we see more than not, um, I mean, probably 90% of the time, it comes down to uh, bullets one and three here. Poor well construction and wells that have been grandfathered in or wells that you know, are still in use that don't meet even current code if there is one, and just the lack of well owner knowledge and education or their understanding of what it means to be a well owner and what they need to be, what they need to know to be a good steward of their well. And actually that's what our class is meant to do. It's meant to give people a broad comprehensive look at what it means to be a well owner and why it's important and how they can protect their family's uh, drinking health anyway. So, um, so the problem we face is that depending on where you live and if you're in an area that has uh, an area that has both rural and uh, urban uh, land use, if you will, um, well owners come from every social, economic, and education class. They've, uh, you know, some have been on a well their whole life, some are new, they moved from a big city to the country for the first time, and don't even realize they have a well. I've got a number of stories about um, what community water operators who were called by a homeowner saying, why isn't my water uh, pressure like it should be or like it was yesterday? only to find out that the other city water across the street, but this person has a private well and it's actually in their front yard and they didn't realize it. So, um, but you know, they can be wealthy, poor, um, very educated, uneducated. You see well owners basically in every demographic and that's what makes it hard for us to reach them. And so, um, you know, for instance, I grew up in a very rural area. I had 19 in my graduating class in high school in central Illinois. Um, there's also a lot of wells in Cook County in Chicago, at Chicago proper, and um, oh, I'm going to skip back. And what most people don't realize, even in Illinois, if I say, did you realize there's over 3,000 private wells in Cook County? Most people would say, there's no way, because all of the collar counties around Cook are also completely urban. But every municipal boundary that doesn't line up, um, or there's some, you know, that's typically what it is. There's these little pockets of areas where they don't have city services because they're not part of the municipal boundary. And there they have septic and wells, and that can affect a lot of other people. So uh, as far as why people don't test, one of the best studies we have is from um, Minnesota. And the Minnesota Department of Health has actually followed up on this work and has a lot of um, a more current information available. This is from probably five or six years ago or maybe a little further back, but they did a large study. They sent out 2,700 questionnaires uh, to people in three states, uh, two counties in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Michigan with different incentives, as you can see in the green box there, um, either a $2 bill and a free test or just a $2 bill or just a free test coupon. And, you know, that matters to people as far as getting, uh, responding to the survey for one. You can see where they, they feel with the $2 bill, they certainly feel like they have a responsibility to respond a little more, which is an interesting finding if you're in social science. But the, the other two graphs are what matter to us the most. So when asked how worried are you about possible health risks from untreated well water, 87% said they were only slightly or not worried at all, even though they hadn't tested. And when asked, they gave them a laundry list of about 15 or 20 different options, and they could click more than one um, on why they hadn't tested. These are the top answers. We've been drinking it for years. We didn't know what to test for. You know, number eight or number um, 10 there, uh, I don't want to know. I had that happen to me. I had a, a well owner. I wanted to test his well uh, for arsenic, and he said, you can sample my well as long as you don't send me the results and you do it when I'm not home. And it ended up being that's because he was trying to sell his house. And in Illinois, there's a law that says there's a form you have to fill out um, when you're selling your home that you have to state yes or no, I know of, it, of any adverse health or issues or issues with my well or septic. And he wanted to be able to honestly answer, answer that, that no, he knew of none, 
because he didn't want to have it tested. And, you know, that's it's an unfortunate situation that we have because economics drives so many things. But you can see this list here. Um, a lot of them come down to people just don't realize, oh, it's probably fine, for instance. Um, we need to find ways uh, to eliminate all of those. Um, so I'm getting to those. I guess I. Um, it comes down to really two of the biggest things were they didn't know, which is on us as health and uh, groundwater professionals, to make sure well owners understand what the risks are, then there are risks, and how simple it is and why it's important to test. And then um, on the other side of that are just an attitude about uh, we know it's we've been drinking it forever, we're going to wait till our neighbors have a problem or someone gets sick, and then they worry about it. It's no different than going to the dentist. You know, you know you need to go. A lot of people put it off and put it off until they finally have that real problem, and then they end up with a root canal or something else. Um, you know, it's just it's not wanting to spend the money, not really wanting to uh, believe that there's going to be a problem. So, um, and why are well owners hard to reach? There are many reasons, as it says here, but really it's just a general belief that well water and groundwater is safe, and that's a hard thing to combat, especially in a rural area. I know um, I grew up on a 14-foot deep hand dug well. My grandpa uh, hand dug in 1933, and uh, on our, I, was, I grew up on a farm. And uh, when it rained hard, our water was muddy. Um, it was really unsafe. It certainly had surface influence. But if you ask my dad, he always said our well water is better than city water because it doesn't have chemicals in it. City puts chemicals in their water. That's bad to him. And how you combat that, it's a real struggle. But uh, it's also human nature, as I mentioned, going to the dentist or doctor, whether there's a real cost or perceived cost. Um, you know, and if no one's gotten sick, then it must be fine. And, uh, you know, that's the worst attitude to have. You need to be proactive, test your water, and make sure there aren't things that cause long-term effects uh, and that sort of thing. Also, just independence and not trusting the government. You know, there's a lot of people, even um, our RCAP folks run into where someone doesn't want them to come on their property to talk to them about their well just because they don't want anyone on their property. And, you know, that's uh, you can lead a horse to water, but uh, that's, you know, those folks you just have to walk away from. So um, a little bit about aquifers and wells, and again, we're taking the stance here with our webinar that um, some of the, the real issues related to well types and stuff aren't well understood. And so um, it really comes down to what's available. The geology determines what type of well you might have. And again, as it says here, some cases there may be choices. You may have, um, I know where I'm at in Champaign County, Illinois, we have two or three sand and gravel aquifers were glaciated and um, that are above bedrock, and then the bedrock also has aquifers that are uh, have potable water in it. So you have a number of choices, but when you reach that first sand and gravel and it's got plenty of water, um, most folks stop there because of the cost per foot of drilling. It doesn't make sense to drill a well three or four times deeper than you need to when you already have a water supply. So, But for health professionals and for us who work in as uh, answering questions for well owners, Understanding the difference between really a sand and gravel well versus a bedrock well, consolidated rock, or if it's a dug or bored well, whether there was no real aquifer there or if it's very old like the well I grew up on. We actually did have an aquifer underneath our uh, farmstead, but it was uh, at 140 feet or so. And, you know, in 1933, that just wasn't uh, what you did. You put in a dug or bored well. So um, as far as dug or bored wells go, they're, they're traditionally more... Uh, susceptible to surface contamination. Their large diameter, you can see this rig here, um, underneath the two guys uh, on the ground you can see that that boring machine has just pulled a bucket of dirt um, that's three, three, a little over three foot diameter and a three foot concrete tile will go in there vertically uh, like the one that uh, goes under a road and so they're usually, uh, although it's changing and they're come using other types of material now, uh, the typical design is with a concrete tile. And then those are four-foot sections, and typically they're not cemented. So they sit on top of each other. They've got a female end and a male end so that they'll sit on each other uh, seamlessly. And uh, water can still seep in on those joints. And so the problem then is if you don't um, grout around the outside to keep, uh, you know, anything out, um, 
water can seep in at a pretty shallow level. And I'll show you an example here. So um, these are all dugger board wells. The first one in the upper left is a dug well where uh, this is a farmstead. That's a pasture. The reason those posts are so worn is because there's cattle in there and they're rubbing against those. And you can see they've got it covered with uh, two by tens and uh, pieces of tin metal and then held down by concrete blocks and rocks. Well, snakes, rats, all kinds of critters can get in there. Uh, they fall in the well, and uh, now your well's contaminated. And so it's just not a good source. It's on a hillside. Cattle can be right next to it. You can see it's kind of muddy there, and you see their footprints. That's also a field up upslope where water can run off. And, uh, you know, it's just very likely this well gets surface water uh, influenced. Uh, and the one on the, the right is a traditional concrete tile um, design where it comes all the way up to the surface, and it's got this large concrete uh, pad on top that's uh, a real pain to move. And, uh, but down in the well, there'll be uh, a line going into the house uh, down below grade, typically uh, below the frost line. And then the one on the bottom left is also a large diameter well. And a more modern design today is to put just a six inch casing down to 10 feet or more, and then have the large diameter, three, uh, three foot diameter casing below that. And that allows you to fill that top upper 10 feet with a more clay material that makes it harder for anything from the surface to seep in. And so um, here's those two designs. The one on the left is the concrete tile going all the way to the surface. And the one on the right has uh, the six inch casing, or in this case it says four inch diameter casing with a pitless uh, and, a pre and everything going to the house. And by doing that and putting the concrete pad down at 10 feet, you're able to put either clean earth fill, as it says here, or a, a more clay material that'll prevent surface water uh, runoff. And in El this is Illinois code, by the way. Um, you do have to put concrete or grout down to 10 feet. Uh, minimum uh, around these wells now and that helps protect from anything right at the surface. The problem we have is that code was changed in the late 90s or maybe early 2000s and before that you could have wells where that uh, you know if the well's sticking up a foot and that's a four foot section that means water could seep in at three feet below ground surface and that's not very protective uh, with a big rainstorm and you've put chemicals either near uh, the well or you know in on your yard we run into these right in the middle of feedlots, out in pastures, or in fields where they're applying chemicals. You know, it's just, um, it wasn't really a known quantity for a long time, and that's that was the most convenient place. And so that's what, what we have and deal with all the time. So sand and gravel wells, so they're finished in a sand and gravel unit, which, a ge geologic unit, and uh, this is a well screen. And the screen is sized by the driller when they're putting the well in based on the size of the sand. They also use a gravel pack, it's called, but it's usually a finer sand that the pack won't go through the screen, um, but you put it around the well so that it helps act as a filter so that finer sand particles can't get through either. And the whole idea with the well screen is it lets the water through and not uh, the sand. You don't want to pump sand. It's, it's no different than the screen on your door. It lets the air in and keeps the flies out, right? So they're usually, uh, the casing is either PVC or steel. Um, a lot of times the screen is stainless and uh, it looks just like this. And that's usually a five foot section uh, or a four foot section for a private well um, at the bottom of the well. So um, what really matters here is uh, the thing to understand is with a sand and gravel well, the water's only coming in at the bottom depending on the length of the screen. So if you have a 200 foot sand and gravel well, and it's only got a four or five foot section of screen, that means water's only coming in the well from 200 up to 195 or 96. So water has to travel from the surface 195 feet through the native material, assuming it's grouted properly and the, the well bore isn't a conduit for things to get through. Um, it has to go all the way through all that native material and that acts as its own filter and typically water quality gets better as you go down uh, from water percolating through the soil. So um, that's, uh, this is just a, a, I wanted to show an example of a log for Illinois. Um, here they had four foot of topsoil and then it was sand from 40 to 40, uh, from four to 45. So this is a very sandy area 
which means, um, you know, when that happens and sand's near the surface, uh, water readily infiltrates and can move through that. So uh, I know we have a county in Illinois where there's about 100 feet of sand and sand's at the surface. I tell well owners there, um, you should put your well in all the way to the bottom and put your screen uh, just above bedrock so that uh, the water from the surface has to infiltrate through all 90 some feet of sand. Um, it's going to be cleaner when it gets to the bottom. And that's uh, just, if uh, some people in those areas put in sand points, which you can drive in yourself, and so it saves you a lot of money, um, but they have no grout. They have, uh, they're usually less than 20 feet deep, and so they're very susceptible to surface contamination. So um, just, just food for thought. So the difference here then with a bedrock well is that um, most of the time, you know, bedrock, the rock itself doesn't yield water. It's the fractures in the rock that yield water. So um, when you drill a bedrock well, you may hit bedrock at 40 feet or at 100 feet or, or 5 feet. Um, typically, you put casing down only 10 to 20 feet into the bedrock. You can see here where it says steel casing, 10 to 20 feet of casing into bedrock, and you seed it into the rock. Once you find some firm rock uh, that's solid, because usually the bedrock's weathered at the surface, and so um, you can, so the rest of that is an open hole, meaning that you might, this could be a 300 foot well, but it might only have uh, 30 feet of casing. And that's so that you can take advantage of those fractures, because if you don't hit fractures, uh, you're not going to have any water. Uh, the problem with that is it's like pipe flow. It's, there's only a small fracture running, uh, usually not linearly, but at some angle, it may go back towards the surface, it may go over to some other uh, set of fractures where, uh, you know, especially in a karst area where you have larger fractures and even caves and sinkholes, uh, maybe there's a, it's connected to the surface somewhere. And, and so bedrock well, in that case, could be more susceptible to surface contamination. And because uh, in a sand and gravel aquifer, you know, if you've got, um, you know, sand, uh, a really good sand aquifer is about 70% sand, and then the 30% pore space is full of water. So if you have 100 feet of sand, you took all the sand away, you'd still have 30 feet of water. And it can travel between all the grains readily. So it's usually a really good water supply and usually pumps a lot. With a bedrock well, it depends on how many fractures you hit, um, how much water's in those, and what the pressure head is in those fractures, and how much where the water's coming from. So it can be influenced over a much larger distance, you can also have a lot more drawdown if you haven't hit very many uh, fractures. And I know one area where we've um, worked with well owners in, in Pennsylvania where um, their wells only yield a couple gallons a minute, and that draws down the well nearly 200 feet. So, uh, you know, it can really make a difference in uh, both water quality and if someone else has got a well near there uh, and those sorts of things. And so... Um, it's really more important, the grouting and everything else too, uh, to make sure that's seeded properly and that there's no connection so that nothing can run along the surface. And it's just, uh, again, the same 200 foot well in bedrock may only have uh, 30 to 50, say, feet of casing. I know now in most states, the rule is, or the, uh, the construction code requires 50 feet, but not everywhere. And there's a lot of older wells that don't meet code today. I know in New York, um, I worked there for a little while on uh, some private well issues, and there are many wells where the casing was less than 20 feet, and the well might be 400 feet deep. But that means that almost the entire length is open to the rock, and that uh, can be a problem if there's any connecting fractures or it goes back to the surface. And here's a well log, again, for Illinois, but just to show you, um, you know, you can look down at number 18 on the right, and it tells you the formation you went through. They went through four feet of sand and gravel at 30 feet. It was probably dry. Um, and then uh, some mixed geologic uh, uh, glacial materials, and they finally hit broken limestone at 189. Uh, they had 68 feet of, of limestone bedrock and then three feet of shale, so they stopped. So shale is basically like a cemented clay. Um, water does not pass through it, so there was no reason to keep going. And so this log's actually wrong. It says, uh, number 12 up there says, water from shale from 257 to 260. 
And I'm sure someone in the office for this drilling company filled this out. And typically the last formation you go into is where you stop and that's where the water's coming from. But in this case, they went into three feet of shale before they stopped. So this should, should say water from limestone bedrock from 189 to 257. So if you look at number 15 here, it says casing and liner. They used PVC for 179 feet almost until they got to bedrock. And then they used steel casing for 20 feet and seeded it 10 feet into the, the limestone. So 10 feet into the bedrock, there's a, a seeded casing, uh, which means it's uh, sealed into the rock so that stuff from the outside can't get in. And then uh, they connected that to uh, 179 feet of PVC up to the top. And that's just because the seal gives it a lot more structural integrity um, down in the well. So uh, that's the difference, especially in, in those. And you can see here, this one shows also a static water level 130 feet, and which means the water level in the bedrock, when they poked a hole in it, basically came up above the top of the rock. And that's typical. So that's kind of artesian aquifer uh, because the pressure in the system is higher than uh, atmospheric. And then when they pumped it at 25 gallons a minute, which is more than you would for almost any home, this was for a campground, um, it dropped at 30 feet. So it's a really good water supply in that respect. So um, what to do about poor construction? Well, um, again, well construction codes continually evolve as we learn more. You know, the Nebraska grout study uh, back in, uh, I believe it was around 2006 or so, found that you know, in certain geologic conditions, grout doesn't necessarily work like it's supposed to, and you have to be careful what kind of grout you use. Most state well construction codes are very rigid about grout and liquid grout, and in some cases those probably aren't the best uh, fit in some geologies. But uh, even though that's the case, I just learned uh, last week of a second state that actually adopted rules based on the Nebraska grout study, and that's only one of two states that I know of. So even though we know that there's issues with grout and always using liquid grout in some geologies, uh, those codes haven't changed. It's, it's you know, because it's got to go through a state legislature, and that typically provides uh, enough of a roadblock to get much done. So, um, so a lot of things have been grandfathered in. We still find wells in pits, which if you're familiar with pitless adapters, you're in a northern climate where you have frost. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you know, the old days they didn't, before the advent of the pitless adapter, wells were put in pits so that they didn't freeze. Uh, the, the pipe didn't at the top. And so we still see wells in pits uh, a lot uh, in rural areas, and they're just a danger, and they shouldn't, uh, they should be uh, changed. So uh, they provide both surface contam contamination hazard and, you know, even a safety hazard, and I think we'll get into that. So again, here's... Um, some wells that we would consider not safe. Um, the one on the bottom you've already seen. Uh, the one on the upper right, uh, that's a dead goat, uh, which, you know, uh, the fact that a goat could fall in a well says something about the way it's protected at the surface. And uh, the fact they didn't know it for a while is also a problem. But then uh, this picture on the upper left came from the Washington De uh, State Department of Ecology. Um, they put on their blog, and, and they're the state agency in Washington that regulates drillers and administers the well construction code. And so it's different in every state. Um, they run it through their Department of Ecology. But this is just a picture of a woman who stepped on that plywood and it broke. She fell in and it killed her. Um, but you, when you look at this whole picture, you can see it's got a suction pump there. And, um, but if you look around, there's a broom and a funnel and a hole in the plywood where that concrete uh, brick used to be, I'm sure, and it looks like insulation, old insulation from the side of the building that's fallen down around there. You know, it's just not uh, a safe way to have your well, and uh, unfortunately, we see these all the time still, uh, and they just need to be taken care of and new wells put in when, when it's feasible. Uh, so yeah, bring them up to code, extend the pipe to the surface. I mentioned well pits. Especially there, you know, those fill up with water and then um, can be a problem. Fill that in with grout. And, uh, you know, the people to talk to are the well authority in the area, our county, uh, our district, and then a contractor and find out what's best. You know, there are cost share programs, especially for abandoned wells, which I'm probably getting ahead of myself. 
uh, in some areas through the Soil and Water Conservation District or others. And because, uh, yeah, it's expensive and some people just don't have the money. But um, it's, just a, it's, it's just a risk that, that no one should take. So going back to abandoned wells, um, because well logs weren't required until the 60s, and I say that for Illinois, it was in 1968, I believe. Um, other states, it wasn't until uh, much later. Nebraska was 86, uh, New York was 2000, and so because of that, um, there are a lot more wells that they don't know about that are in their state than that they do. And in Illinois, um, when I go out, we did a we did a study looking at how many wells would be impacted by a regional well field for a community. And so I had five students go out and spend a summer going door to door, inventorying every well in nine townships. And this is a very rural farming area. There were 1,708 wells uh, that we located, and we did not have logs on file for 788 of those, you know, almost half. And that's... Uh, and that's even though we've had a requirement, and our drillers in Illinois um, are very good about filing logs. It, you know, they inspect every new well. Um, well, uh, well, well drillers who don't do that and they get caught or uh, lose their license, all those sorts of things, where that's from the 60s. And so you can imagine what it is in other states where they didn't pass laws till later or they're not as diligent about enforcing their laws. Um, and they're really like a well pit. They're a safety hazard, and they're also a potential source of contamination. I can't tell you how many times we've heard stories of people who use it as a place to dump things, and that's absolutely the worst thing you can do, uh, especially if it's a conduit directly to an aquifer. And so you should probably abandon it. I mentioned the soil and water conservation districts may have a program. But uh, the thing to remember, what I tell well owners, and you should too, is if you have an old well on your property and someone falls in and gets hurt or gets killed, um, you're going to end up maybe losing your property or, you know, you're going to be sued or it's going to be you're being found at fault, even if they weren't supposed to be there. So um, it's better just to fill those in and properly abandon the well. Um, yeah, and unfortunately that's not enforced as well uh, in most states. And here's just some examples. Uh, the two pictures of both, again, are from the Washington State Department of Ecology from their blog. And, uh, you know, one's a horse they're trying to get out of a well, and the other one, a man, fell 45 feet into a well. And luckily, somehow, he was unhurt. And uh, these newspaper clippings are all from um, Illinois. used to have a groundwater education coordinator, and uh, he, was, he went, worked with schools and teachers and anyone who would listen about uh, the importance of groundwater protection. And uh, he gave these to me. Um, and three of these are from Illinois different parts of the state. And the third one down is Jessica McClure. Everybody who's old enough remembers when she was uh, trapped in a well in Texas. It took like 18 hours, I think, to get her out. And it was covered live on CNN. And, uh, and I think and that was in the 90s as well. So, um, you know, it happens more than you think is the bottom line. So as far as uh, groundwater and health gaps, I wanted to talk about that. Um, the thing, most health professionals don't really understand groundwater very well. That's not why you went to school. And I, I didn't go to school to be a health professional. And though I've learned quite a, a number of things, um, I understand uh, the significance of having a real health professional on our team and uh, folks I can go to uh, to answer questions and make sure we're giving well owners the best advice. And the thing to understand as a health professional is that groundwater is complicated. You know, the, many times there are multiple aquifers in one at one location. So you can't look at a water quality sample for one well and say, you know, here's what we know is going on and here's how many people are drinking it. Um, it could be that uh, part of some of the wells are in one aquifer and some are in a different aquifer um, and that has they can have very different water quality. And also in areas where there are no aquifers where you typically have dug and bored wells, those are very locally influenced only. So if you have um, a township with uh, 200 bored wells, every one of them could have differing water quality. You can't uh, make any assumptions based on one to the next or the average findings from a few, just because they're very locally influenced and they're using mostly the water table for their water supply. Or maybe a very thin, maybe there's a three inch layer of sand that the driller hit and that's where he finished this large diameter well 
um, that may only go 20 yards in any direction. You can't, uh, there's no connection, so the water qualities are different. And, and so you, you know, we've had folks uh, look at some cancer data in certain counties and say, well, this must be attributed to the aquifer. And come to find out, there's three different aquifers there, different geologies, totally different um, water qualities. And you know, you just unless you understand those things, you can make some real uh, poor inf uh, inferences, if you will. So, um, and water issues aren't straightforward. You know, a lot of people look at community water issues. Um, I, I meant to correct this. It's Johns Hopkins. Um, Johns Hopkins convened a work group to look at uh, CDC strategic plan for private wells. They sent out a list of issues that are related to, um, that should be a concern related to private wells. And one of the things they listed was algal blooms. And um, the reason they have that wrong, obviously algal blooms are a surface water problem, is because they took the list of problems from EPA's website for community water supplies. They are not community water supplies. Community water supplies vary. They from groundwater to groundwater under the influence of surface water to surface water. And so you need to understand what groundwater issues there are, as well as, you know, there's a difference between a groundwater sample and a drinking water sample. A groundwater sample is what the water quality is in an aquifer. A drinking water sample is a sample you pull from your kitchen tap and that the people in the house are drinking that's gone through treatment, a softener, a filter, um, gone through lead pipes or copper pipes with lead solder or some or galvanized pipe. I mean, there's a lot of other things that go into play there that you need to understand where your sample's coming from. And I'll, I'm going to answer that in the questions. Uh, that specific thing is important to us. You know, as a groundwater hydrologist, um, it's important to me to understand uh, both the groundwater quality and the drinking water quality. And so the, the best way to do that is to collect more than one sample where it's appropriate. Okay, so um, so the bottom line is professionals from both disciplines can learn from each other, and you should have a team that includes both. And sometimes that may be a driller, it may be a, a, someone from your state geological survey um, or a local hydrologist, but uh, their input's valuable. And, um, you know, uh, the high arsenic example, I don't, I don't remember what that was, to be honest, um, but the lagoon example is when we put this assessment tool together, we had folks from probably eight or nine different states and one of the pieces of the assessment uh, tool asks what kind of septic system you have. You know, is it a conventional septic tank? Is it aerobic or whatever? And when we were going through this, one of the folks from Nebraska who was on the team said, you don't have lagoons in here. And I'm like, lagoons? Uh, we're talking about private septic systems. Well, it turns out even in my state, Illinois, you can have a lagoon as your septic system. And that's the case in Oklahoma, Nebraska, and a number of other states, which, you know, I learned from that uh, by having that group of folks with different viewpoints and disciplines. And so uh, it is the best way to make sure that you cover all your bases. And that was the point there. And I just show this. I spent a lot of my career working in the Muhammad Aquifer, um, which is in central Illinois. So if you start at the bottom, it's bedrock. Then the first glacier came and left all the sand and the Sankoti sand member there, which is the Muhammad Aquifer. Then when that glacier melted, uh, the, the dashed and dark line that's about halfway up that says uh, Yarmouth uh, Genesaw on the one side there, um, that was the land surface. Then another glacier came, uh, to make a long story short, and then the third glacier came along. So we've had three sets of glaciation and all three left sand, silt, and clay. And it's the Muhammad, which is the deep one, uh, that's the largest, and it extends over 11 counties in Illinois. But a private well could be in any of these little sand layers that you see going all the way up to the Cahokia Formation, which are all below land surface. So, um, you know, when a well driller is drilling a well and they hit 15 feet of sand and the water comes up 20 feet above the aquifer in the, in the well board that they're putting in, that's enough of a water supply for a private well for sure, so they're going to stop. And that could be at 60 feet, it could be at 150 feet. Um, you know, that red line basically shows that you could hit four or five different aquifers if you were drilling in that location. And it depends on what you want. If I were putting in an irrigation well, I'd certainly go down to the Muhammad. But for a private well, most of those would work. So what's the best thing to do is develop a relationship with your scientific surveys, uh, your USGS, state GS, and Illinois Water Survey. 
Also, uh, the agencies that regulate and um, regulate drillers, well construction, or, or drinking water quality. So there's, you know, in every state they're different. Uh, some I know, like Michigan was DEQ, and they just changed their name, and I can't even tell you what it is. I just found that out last week. But um, also extension, and it depends on the state, but in some states, uh, the Cooperative Extension Service at your land-grant university has a really great program. Um, some that we work with, Texas, Mississippi, uh, Virginia, um, Rhode Island, and Pennsylvania. And they've been working with well owners for many years and already have materials available that you can use. They know a lot about the geology and water quality in their state and the well owners and the types of wells. And they're someone you should uh, get to know and work with. So um, also the folks that map aquifers and maintain well logs uh, or collect groundwater quality information. And you just need to find that stuff out. You know, even as simple as Googling uh, Missouri well logs will take you right to Missouri DNR. And you can look up locations. In Illinois, our state geological survey, we both house uh, well records. But they have an online tool that you can go to and you can look and see every well that's in your nearby area. It's all public information. So they're always a great resource. And um, that will help you understand what you're up against and what information may or may not be available in your area. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the private well class before we get to the questions. Um, if you're not familiar with the class itself, it's 10 lessons that are sent uh, via email over 10 weeks. So if someone signs up for the private well class on our website, it sends them an email with a PDF for lesson one, and then the same time every week, you'll get this next lesson. And we think that works pretty well, because um, for as many people in the evaluation that say that that's too fast, we have as many people say that's too slow. So it's self-paced, you can keep the PDFs, and it allows people to kind of get a, a, a good understanding of um, what it means to be a well owner, how water gets in their well, what their well type means, common problems, all those sorts of things. And um, we also do a lot of multimedia stuff, which I'll talk about here in a second. But um, this webinar, along with others, are meant to kind of supplement that, but this is not the class. Uh, I just want to make that clear, because we have a lot of people who think these webinars are the class, and there's a lot more information in those lessons. In total, the 10 lessons are about 86 pages. And they, they pull from a lot of other good resources that you can go to uh, for additional information. So this is the front page of the Private Well Class website. You click on Learn by Email, and it takes you to the page where um, I'm getting, uh, let me go back here. It takes you to a page where you can sign up. Um, for each lesson, this is for lessons one and two, we list a lot of resources that are out there that we consider, um, you know, if you don't like the way the Private Well Class is written, or if something doesn't make sense to you, you can look at all these other uh, resources, and there's links to all of them, um, that would give you more information and explain things maybe in a different or better way for you. So um, there's one of these for all 10, uh, again, on our website under Resource Library. Uh, we have the entire class in Spanish. You can go to this web page and uh, um, send somebody there if they want to take the lessons in Spanish, including all the figures. It's all been redone. And um, it's available that way. This is just one of the example pages that's in Spanish, just to show this is identical to the English version, uh, except that uh, all the text has been changed to reflect uh, Spanish language. So the goal of our program really is to help well owners understand why their well is important, why they need to understand how it works, and really that's so they can protect themselves from risk. A lot of people just assume and that they're wrong to do so and not realize what some simple things they might be able to do to really impact the quality of the water in their well. So um, it's really worthwhile to go through is the bottom line. And the reviews we've gotten over the last uh, five years or four and a half years that we've had this out there, um, we've had about 7,000 people take the class and well over 99% would recommend it to others. And I don't know the stat today, but it's uh, almost everyone. So. We also uh, do webinars like the one we're on today, and this one was done, um, I'm using the old one here, I forgot to update the slide. We did one in August of 2018 on what well owners need to know about lead, and it wasn't just us. I brought in someone from Virginia Tech who's an expert on lead issues uh, to participate. 
Um, and we try to do that where it's appropriate. We do the same thing for the septic side. We do one in July, and uh, um, we use one of the RCAP folks in Massachusetts who used to be a sanitarian and inspect septic systems uh, to actually provide all the you know, great advice people need related to their septic system. And so for some of these webinars, like the one on lead, we did that as a service just because of all the, you know, the push button lead issues that have come up over the last three or four years. Um, we created a page. Um, it's just privatewellclass.org slash lead, and it takes you to um, a lot of resources that you can use uh, to understand better what your risks are. And, you know, um, lead is not a groundwater problem. It's a premise plumbing problem and a service line problem. It's um, if your water's corrosive and you have lead pipes, galvanized pipes, or, lead, or, or copper pipes that use lead solder, um, that's where you see lead issues in your drinking water. Um, in many cases, the water coming out of the well has zero lead in it. It's the premise plumbing in your home uh, that sitting overnight, and if it's uh, at all corrosive, can leach out some of the lead out of those pipes, and that's what ends up in your drinking water. So. Um, you need to understand how those uh, situations occur and, and why and when, you know, the best thing to do is always test uh, to find out if you even have an issue. Other types of web, uh, we also have these training videos. They're on, you know, what is an aquifer? How does my pressure tank work? Um, what should I know about a shared well? It's, a, it's really interesting how different, different states handle wells where more than one home is on a well. In Washington State, they actually regulate down to two wells, on, or two homes on one well is considered a special type of community water supply, and they have requirements under the law, where in most states, the federal requirement is 15 homes or 25 people, and so we even have uh, contractors around the country who have went in and built subdivisions where they put one well every five to seven homes um, to save them money, and then you have five to seven homes who all have to share a well uh, that may be uh, appropriate for that or may not. Um, a lot of times there's no shared owner agreement. Uh, it's the person who has the property where the well exists that really owns it, and it can lead to a lot of hard feelings and problems for people. And so there's really a lot to know about shared wells if you have any in your area. Um, we also have podcasts. We've only done the first three lessons, uh, one, two, and three listed up there, and then some of the radio interviews we've done for RFD Illinois. Um, these are a lot more popular than I would have ever imagined. Uh, well over 2,000 downloads, and um, you know it's just another way to get information out there to people about um, private wells and some of those issues. So as far as for EHPs, you know what we've learned early on. Well, the first say 500 to 1,000 people that took our class, 21% were sanitarians, and in the evaluation they said two things: one, how can I get CEUs for this? And two, why wasn't this available when I started my job? So we reached out to NEHA, and now they have a version of our class on their e-learning site. So you can get up to 10 CEs. I think I mentioned that earlier. And also, uh, Association of, uh, I think it's State Health Inspectors. I can't remember uh, exactly what the acronym is. But uh, ASHI also uses NEHA's website for accrediting their home inspectors um, for um, private well issues, and this is free to anyone. Uh, anyone can create a login on NEHA's website and take this class uh, without paying anything, and that's part of the deal because we're federally funded, it needs to be available to everybody, and then that's an advantage to all of you. Just like you know, we held a conference last week for two and a half days, brought in a bunch of experts, and all the attendees attended for free. Uh, I mean, they had to pay their own way, but uh, there was no registration fee, so um, it's actually a good spot to be in. We also host workshops, and so does RCAP around the country. I mentioned that. Um, the assessment tool, I'm not going to talk uh, much about that today, but it's like in a, if you're in an area where you do sanitary surveys for your community systems, it's very much like a sanitary survey. It's like a deficiency or vulnerability uh, tool. You look at all these different situations. I think there's 18 sections, and it helps you evaluate the risk a well owner might have. And uh, we are developing a guide. We have a draft of it done. We're just uh, trying to finalize it, and we've created... Um, a tablet version for both iOS and Android, uh, but I will mention the caveat that you have to have a fair amount of wherewithal to use the tool and be the person filling it out, because there's a lot of questions on there that you have to have some understanding of uh, 
of wells and geology and those issues. So um, we do have a partners page and a partner newsletter. The newsletter isn't for well owners, it's for those that serve them. So um, we put out information that would be beneficial to EHPs, realtors, labs, um, you know, county health departments, all that sort of thing. And uh, you can take a look at that. Uh, if you go to the partner resources page, here's a place for you to sign up. If you go down the page below this, um, it, you can see all the newsletters. Uh, obviously, we're up past uh, 35 now, but um, you can take a look at a few of those. And if you think it's worthwhile, which you know we work hard to make sure there's no fluff in our newsletter so that it's actually useful information, um, then feel free to subscribe. It's free as well. Uh, this is just one of the newsletters, a past issue. This is from 17. I highlight this because we did a well sealing demonstration in cooperation with the Groundwater Guardians Group and Western Illinois University and Gingrich Well Drilling, uh, which are out of Iowa. Um, but this home is actually four blocks from the county square, or this town square in a town of 15,000 people, uh, Macomb, Illinois. These people bought this house, realized they had an old dug well uh, right next to their back wall of their house in their yard. And they've had city water since I believe 1913 or something like that. And yet this well's still here. So they contacted a couple folks and we got involved and it was used as a demonstration project. All the county health departments in the area brought staff and they got CEUs uh, to see how this should be properly abandoned. And this is uh, one of the folks from Gingrich Well Drilling uh, putting some bentonite down the, the well. So it was in, we've created a video of that, uh, Katie did, and it's uh, on our website and available to watch. Or you can go to the September 17 newsletter and click on the link there too. So um, we do have uh, an online workshop for environmental health professionals. We haven't got the next one scheduled yet. We don't do it that often, but it's a four hour workshop. So that's a lot to do online, but it's uh, about an hour and a half of it is covering our well assessment tool and uh, or about half of it is about is covering our well assessment tool and how to use it and we go through three different examples of information that's been available and then the other is about best practices for well owner outreach we did a study for CDC where we reached out to a hundred programs around the country that work with well owners and found out what they would do differently what they did well what they did poorly what they would recommend if you're going to try to reach out to well owners we developed a paper that was published in the Journal of Water and Health, which doesn't help most of uh, you or me. I don't read uh, journals that often, but um, we do have that available, and it's uh, been approved for four hours of NEHA credit, but it's a really good practical approach to how to even start an outreach program to well owners in your jurisdiction. So um, you can watch our website or send, ask to get on our email list, and when we do set that up, it'll probably be this fall, um, we can let you know because it's uh, it's it's really worthwhile. Uh, we learned a lot by talking to a hundred other programs. Is the bottom line. So as far as the site assessment, a little bit about that. It's it's both a site assessment. You go out to the site, but it's also about the well. You look at the log if you can find it, and a geologic assessment. And then uh, really the point of it is it's something you can hand back to the well owner that lists all the things they need to be concerned about. It's an opportunity to talk about testing and best management practices. And if they're in a vulnerable geology, in a floodplain or a karst or something like that, or a saltwater intrusion area, um, it's a chance to explain why those things happen and occur and why they need to either test more frequently or be concerned or, you know, maybe they, somebody's doing the assessment because they've tested their well three different times and chlorinated and disinfected and they still have bacteria problems. Well, it may be that you're in a karst geology where you're always going to have bacteria problems and the solution is to add continuous uh, disinfection. And that's just the way it is uh, in some cases. So it is an opportunity to really dig into the details with a well owner and explain to them some of the important things they need to know about their wells. Um, and again, I think I've covered this. It's like a site assessment uh, or it's like a sanitary survey. But more than that, it gives you a chance uh, to promote best practices and encourage communication. Uh, it's a chance to say, hey, you can contact your local health department. You know, they're not going to condemn your well where some well owners are afraid to even call their local health department because they think they have the power to condemn their well. And, you know, I, I'll be honest, I've ran into a couple local health districts, um, one in Massachusetts and I think the other was a county in New York, where they actually have 
given themselves that kind of authority, but those are the only two places in the country. Everywhere else, uh, you know, a health department is out there trying to encourage people to, to use best practices and sample, and if they have something, add treatment. You know, if you have arsenic, um, you know, in Illinois, I ran across a family with seven kids that had arsenic at 250 ppb, um, and I encouraged them to contact their health department. And, and explain to them that, you know, the health department isn't going to tell you you can't drink your water. Um, they're going to encourage you to or encourage you to add treatment because you really should because it's a risk to your children and to you, um, but it's really up to the well owner, and that's both, that's a double-edged sword that, that we run against a lot. Um, so this says 1,100 assessments. That should say 1,800 um, that RCAP have done around the country. They've also done tons of workshops around the country and uh, educated over 600 professionals, uh, mostly EHPs, um, from the, they did a in-person four-hour workshop for a, a few years. And now we've taken over that responsibility and are doing it online. But it allows you to develop a partnership with RCAP um, or them to develop a partnership with you uh, to reach your well owners better and, and provide you those resources. So, um, oh wow. This is the conference we held in 2017. Um, we just held the one in 2019. The one in 2017 was in Champaign, and I guess I have that here because uh, we recorded all the presentations. So if you want two and a half days of recorded presentations that are specifically about private wells, you can watch the entire conference. So when you go to our, our private well page, there's a thing that says the 2017 conference. You click on it, it brings you to this page, and uh, the last line here above the uh, the video says the conference was recorded and videos are now available on YouTube. You click on that and it takes you to the entire thing. Um, we just held the 2019 conference. We had it in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Similar format. Um, we covered topics like septic systems and funding for private wells and also uh, a lot about treatment and how, what nitrate treatment is and, and arsenic treatment and a number of other things and what, you know, working with treatment professionals and some of those issues. So we also recorded this, um, but it's our um, communications group at the University of Illinois, and the gentleman who went out there with us to do that um, will probably have those done in a month or two, um, I'm hoping. Um, so what we put in, uh, we just sent an email out to all the participants. We had about 125 people there and uh, we told them it'd be the end of summer, but hopefully it'll be sooner than that. But again, all of these presentations are available and, you know, things about springs in the first conference uh, led, um, you know, you can look through them and see what the topics are. Some innovative ideas on how to do outreach locally. You know, um, we highlighted a county in Oregon that bought equipment for a school and now uh, it's the science classes that are doing the testing and sending out the kits and also writing the letters to the well owners. So it's also an educational program uh, to teach kids at these two high schools about private wells. So there's a lot of cool stuff um, between the two conferences, uh, if you're interested in that, that you can go, go do. And uh, I think lastly here, we developed this brochure. And if you notice the big blue area underneath private well class, it's blank. That's so that as a, a lab or a health professional or a realtor or whoever, you can put your own label on that, and um, we provide these to anyone who wants them for free. And so um, when we put a call out for these through our newsletter and through Neha's newsletter, um, we've done it twice, March of 18 and November of 18, and we've sent out over 45,000 of these to over 300 different uh, agencies and health districts and labs. Um, and so there's something you can hand out and it really just has information about our class. This is the inside, it's a trifold. And, um, you know, I'm not sure when we're gonna do this the next time, probably this fall. But if, um, when we do, we'll send something out in our newsletter. And, um, you know, one of the state labs, I think it was Indiana, asked for, you know, 1,500 of these. And we have a number of state agencies who are using them too to pass out to well owners. So um, it's something you can give people if you're interested and, uh, you know, we. We hope it's something you think would be useful. Uh, it's also available in Spanish. Uh, like everything else we've been doing, we try to make it available. 
there are certainly pockets of uh, native Spanish speakers all over the country, but uh, in many places they're on private wells. And so, um, you know, we've had quite a, a need. I think of the 45,000 of those, we've sent out probably uh, at least four or 5,000 have been in Spanish. So, so let's get to the questions. Um, we are going to answer a fair number of them today, but like I said, we've had, I think there was 80 or 90 questions this time. And um, so if you asked a question about your rules or your state, um, just send us an email because we'll have to look into that. Um, I apologize, my phone's ringing. That's not supposed to happen during this. Uh, there we go. Um, yeah, and if we'll look into it because uh, you know, there were a number of questions about things that we don't have expertise. Uh, you know, explain, one was about seeding a well and exactly how that, I, I know the, how it's done, but I don't have all the details. I've not uh, ever seeded a bedrock well. I've drilled a few sand and gravel wells in my day, um, but there's some things we just don't have the expertise for. And so um, we'll try to get those put together, uh, the ones we can, um, but in some cases it may be better to talk to a different type of professional like a well driller uh, to answer those questions. So, And it's a, also an opportunity, uh, the way I look at it, for you to um, identify a, a well driller. And if you need help identifying drillers, uh, the National Groundwater Association certifies drillers. They have a master driller program. You know, that's one of the things we would recommend is that you uh, try to work with those folks in your state because they're more likely uh, to have more wherewithal and more professionalism in some of those things because they went to the trouble um, of being certified that way. Um, and I'll remind you, too, in the question box or chat box, uh, you can ask a question there. Katie's monitoring that. I will mention that I forgot to download the URL, uh, and I turned off my email, Katie. So um, I'm going to have to take a second at the end to pull up the questions, but uh, we'll get to that when we get there. So the first question um, I want to answer is, is it okay for health officials to refer homeowners to water treatment companies for their water quality issues? You know, this is a good question. It came up a lot last week in our conference because we had a lot of treatment people there. You know, there's they get a bad rap because uh, in some cases you have folks who are less than reputable trying to sell equipment to people they don't need. And uh, we've certainly seen that. I know Penn State even has a paper about what you should go through before you pick a treatment professional. And so, um, you know, my point here is, uh, one, I'm going to assume that they've already tested so they know what their water quality issues are, because if not, the first person to send them to is not a water treatment company, but to a lab. And, uh, you know, we probably recommend a certified or university lab uh, that's not biased and that has met, you know, all the testing criteria so they know what their issues are. Um, I wouldn't go straight to a treatment professional first. I would test and see what's in my water. Um, and so the point there I made a second ago is that in every profession, there are good and bad apples. So um, if you're going to refer anyone to a specific vendor, make sure you know that they're reputable and that, you know, you've got either folks you trust who have told you that and use them or whatever. And, you know, uh, as an example, when I went to put the conference together that we had last week, I needed some treatment professionals there, and I don't know a lot of treatment professionals. So I relied on several people I trust at other places who are in the private well uh, arena and are good at their job and, um, you know, I know are trustworthy. And they gave me vendors they worked with, and that's who I had come talk at our conference. And then I still vetted them myself and, and reached out to each one and said, you know, don't make this a sales pitch and all that stuff. So do your due diligence is my point there, I guess. Um, an alternative is to refer them to the Water Quality Association. So this is an association that represents treatment manufacturers, but they also um, are a third-party certifier for treatment equipment, like NSF and uh, the National Sanitation Foundation and UL, Underwriters Laboratories. And it's a separate group. They have a standards program. They also have a program for their professionals to get trained. And uh, they've got, um, I can't remember what it's called, so that's why I didn't put it in here, but um, it, it makes them go through a class and includes a code of ethics that they all agree to follow. And, you know, that's not 100% guarantee, um, but it's uh, a lot better than, than the alternative. So, um, and the last point here is do you find someone that you can ask questions to 
that's a treatment vendor and they're good at doing that and they provide you great advice and it's clear they want to help and they're not just looking to make uh, some money, I would use them and continue to use them. It's like where you take your car. You know, uh, early on, um, I tried several places and almost in every, you know, two or three times I had bad experiences and I finally found someone that is honest and trustworthy and that's the only place I take my car. So it's, it's really the same type of, of situation. So what a test for, um, and we put this in almost all our webinars, but this is what we recommend. You know, annually, coliformin bac coliformin bacteria and nitrate, those are indicators, and the reason you test for those is because if they can get in your well, so can other things. You shouldn't have elevated nitrate or bacteria in your well. It means it's not sealed properly or there's a source. And, and so that's something you want to do all the time. And then if you haven't ever tested a well, what we tell people is you want to test for all the things that are listed here. Um, gives you a good uh, overview of the chemistry. Some of it depends on what kind of piping you have. I know out east you see more galvanized piping than you do like here in Illinois. But this is something that a, a water quality professional could use to give you a good understanding of, you know, most groundwater is going to be hard and it's going to be high in iron. So you're going to use, you know, uh, and if it's, uh, if you need a softener and all those things. So uh, then pH is important along with uh, alkalinity to determine how corrosive your water might be and all those sorts of things. But it is situational. And honestly, what I tell well owners is that you should contact your local health department uh, to see if there's anything else. And uh, I'll show an example of that, why it's important. But it does matter. Uh, and a lot of times if in the source aquifer, if it's a very extensive aquifer, there's a lot of water quality data available if you know where to find it, and you know it should be fairly similar. Like we know which aquifers in Illinois have arsenic and which don't, uh, for instance. So as some examples, um, and your state agency may have some information as well. So uh, here, Massachusetts DEP has this website that a well owner can go and type in their address and they'll tell them if they need to worry about uranium or arsenic. And uh, so that's pretty handy. Uh, if they've already done the legwork to map this stuff, and they do have map tools. Uh, you can zoom in and do other things. Uh, and I'll show you an example of that in a second. This is on Rhode Island Department of Health's webpage. Um, all the little dots are where there used to be orchards, and they know there's soil contamination from arsenic. You know, arsenic was the pesticide of choice uh, for a long time. And uh, so in some places, there's significant soil contamination, and eventually some of that's going to leach down into the ground, or down into the water table and the aquifers. Um, but the big splotch in the middle is why I show this slide. Uh, hopefully everybody can see that. Um, that is where there is high beryllium. And uh, until I found this on Rhode Island's website, um, I didn't realize beryllium was even a regulated contaminant. But if you look at the primary drinking water contaminants on the Safe Drinking Water Act uh, webpage at EPA, this is listed there. Beryllium has health effects. And so um, it's the only place I've ever really encountered that there's high beryllium. Uh, again, I didn't even realize that was a contaminant until um, I saw this on their website. So it's always good to investigate what might be in your area, talk to your state agency, um, the people who collect water quality data, um, talk to even extension. You know, somebody's going to know if there's an existing issue already. You don't need to uh, reinvent the wheel and sample and uh, for everything. Um, and just like we know what counties in Illinois we need to be concerned about arsenic. I'll mention that again just because uh, the county health departments are aware and they uh, have information available for their uh, well owners uh, because of that. And, you know, we're going to see more and more of these. This is from um, Wisconsin, and it's put together by uh, Wisconsin DNR, who is the authority uh, for drinking water supplies and for private well uh, stuff, uh, regulating drillers and construction codes and stuff. But they've taken all the groundwater quality data they have, and they've mapped it into this nice tool uh, based on private well samples. So up in the upper right, I clicked on arsenic by county, and it shows me that for the samples they have, um, you know, they have one county where none was detected, but in most of the counties, it's somewhere between 0 and 5, or 1 and 5 micrograms per liter, which the current st health standard's 10 for a community water supply. And... Um, you can see here that if you're near Green Bay, there's three counties where the average of the samples is over 21. That's twice the health standard, 
twice the health standard, and there's a few counties that are clear, and that means that they don't have any samples for private wells in those counties. And so um, tools like this uh, are certainly invaluable. If I'm moving to Wisconsin, I'm going to look on here if I'm going to buy a property with a private well, uh, or if I live there, I'm moving somewhere else um, to understand that situation. And so um, we expect to see more of this. You know, some of the uh, issues have been with uh, property values and things like that that cause a problem. Um, I know uh, Rhode Island has kind of the strictest rule in the country at a home sale. Uh, it's tied to their uh, building inspectors. And if uh, they do a water quality analysis and it shows that there's a contaminant over a, a Safe Drinking Water Act MCL, they're required to remediate that before they sell the property or the uh, building inspector can condemn the property. And that's the only state that I know of that's got those kind of rules. But it's, you know, all in the name of protecting public health, so, which I'm sure all of you understand. Um, so where to sample and why? Um, when is it best to collect a water sample from a faucet in the house? And when is it best to, to sample near, at or near a well? I mentioned that earlier, groundwater sample versus a drinking water sample. So um, the question we got, we got several questions related to this, but not exactly this question. So I use this one as kind of a composite. So what our lab does and what Dan's group does is they suggest the well owner sample both places. They sample outside uh, or inside at a kitchen tap that's after treatment, through, going through all the premise plumbing, and then also um, outside at a spigot that's either by the well or before any kind of treatment and it's straight from the well. So the outside tap, you let that run for a while and now your, your pump's been on for a little bit. Now you're actually pumping well water that hasn't been sitting in the column or in any of the pipes and that should be your natural groundwater quality. And the kitchen tap is representative then of your drinking water that's been through softener, filter, RO, whatever it might be, and they can be significantly different, as I mentioned before, based on how the chemistry's changed because of what you've either removed or added, uh, like a softener is, is it exchanging, or if you have ion exchange or something like that. Um, so it, it does make a difference. And I'm gonna show that from this example these are, I'm going to have three samples here. One is the outside tap, this one, and it's from 2015. It's a 240 foot deep sand and gravel well near Champaign. And you can see the raw water had, if you look on the right side, in the second group, it says turbidity is 29.8, colors uh, 48.1, pH is 8.2, and then down below that it says the hardness is 351. And on the left side, the, at the bottom of the first group, it says uh, sodium is 25.9, okay? So then we run that through a, a softener and a filter, and the filter has certainly, uh, the softener, excuse me, has certainly reduced the hardness from 351 down to 0.68, so it did its job. But it also, if you look at the sodium value on the left side, has changed that from 25.9 to 198. So someone on a low sodium diet uh, could have a problem if they're drinking a lot of water, um, they do make, uh, as Dan will tell you, um, other types of softener salt like potassium chloride that would replace it with potassium instead, and so you don't have that issue. But you can see what it also did to turbidity and color. It put them, uh, it, the filter and the softener together have, have done a lot to improve water quality, and the less than arrows mean it's less than detection. But uh, this particular person also had a RO unit at their kitchen tap, and so when they took a sample after that, you can see almost everything's below detection. Sodium's even down to 6.24 from 198, um, but the pH has changed to 6.23. And that, uh, we're, I don't know if we're, say we're blessed or whatever in Illinois, the pH of our groundwater is usually over seven and a half. And so it's typically not corrosive. Uh, that's not the only way to gauge corrosivity, but um, it's one good indicator, pH is. And now we've created a, a water sample that's below uh, neutral. And so that could have other effects. Uh, so you just need to be careful and understand um, what treatment does and how it can change things. And you know, this is and the well owner did all this on their own, which is really cool that they had this information available. Uh, you don't get this very often. So um, well disinfection. So what is the standard formula for chlorinating a domestic well? As maintenance, no coliforms detected. I'm so glad someone asked this because. Um, it's really important to understand that you should not chlorinate your well as maintenance. 
you should only chlorinate your well um, when you have sampled and determined that you have bacteria. So we recommend, and so does everyone else, coliform testing once a year, and any time the well's been opened or any time you notice a difference in taste, odor, or color. Those are the only times you should, uh, yeah, unless you've, after one of those things, you sample and you found coliform, uh, that's the only time you should disinfect. So chloride is a oxidant, and so it can release metals, especially you hear stories all the time of people pouring direct, uh, taking Clorox and pouring it straight down their well. At that 5%, uh, if it's a bedrock well and there are any metals in the rock, you're going to leach them out. And uh, you might see a spike in lead or arsenic or a number of other things Dan can probably fill you in on. Um, but it's also hard on your components. If you have a pitless, those can have rubber seals, and that chlorine hitting those things uh, makes them brittle and go bad a lot quicker. And so, uh, which is why when we get to the disinfection part, you should mix it first. But uh, it's just a bad idea to chlorinate as a maintenance uh, plan. If someone tells you that, let me know who. I'll call them because it's bad advice. Um, and as far as best practices of chlorinated well, this is a question we got. Um, you know, we recommend using the Minnesota Department of Health. Has They've actually got a newer version of this that we don't like as well. So we have the older version on our website. And I mentioned those resources earlier. If you go to Lesson 10, under Water Treatment Solutions, you'll see a link to the Minnesota Disinfection Guide. And that's this one, which is a, uh, it's seven or eight pages, but it walks you through step by step, tells you what you need to do. And because of the flooding in Texas, uh, Texas Extension, working with Virginia Tech and a few others, I think Louisiana State, uh, developed a handout that they can use in these flooded areas where they had thousands of wells that got flooded after the hurricanes and it's a trifold. And it really covers the same steps, but in a lot more condensed form. Um, so, um, but you can, here's the URL for that. And, uh, you know, we can make these available uh, to everyone later. You can email us and ask for this uh, URL. Um, but the Minnesota one is on our webpage, and it's the one that we recommend. Until another one, a better one comes out, you know, there's one thing that we know, uh, we do know today that we didn't know, or I didn't know five years ago, and that's in other parts of the country, uh, pH isn't always so high, or, or when it gets too high, um, chlorine becomes uh, less effective. So um, over about, I believe it's eight, I'm, I'm not, uh, I have to learn more about this. Um, you can add a lot of chlorine and still not kill all the uh, coliforms because it's just not, um, it's not effective. It, it converts to a form of uh, chlorine that's just not effective at killing uh, the bacteria. So it does matter. Um, yeah, so the next slide is just more from what's on that page. And it's even got um, recommendations for, you know, tells you how to mix it. Again, you want to mix it so that it's at a certain concentration. You don't want to mix it straight. And you should use a chlorine bleach uh, that doesn't have any fragrances or anything else in it. And uh, the other thing I learned from one of the talks last week uh, that Virginia Tech gave at our conference is that chlorine has a shelf life. So you can't stick some chlorine on your shelf and use it two years later. It, it's just not as effective. Uh, one of the recommendations needs to be that you go out and get new chlorine when you're going to disinfect your well. And it, uh, it even has advice on treatment equipment, and it recommends you go to the Water Quality Association uh, because they have a lot of the manufacturer's recommendations for all the equipment uh, that's used for treatment. And so you can also call them and they'll help you uh, there. That's, they do a lot of good work. So, um, Dan, I'm going to let you answer this question in the next one. <clears throat> okay. Thanks, Steve. Uh, we have various questions, people asking, you know, isn't chlorine dangerous or some, some form like that. Uh, chlorine is on the uh, EPA's uh, national primary drinking water standards list, so you can go there. Uh, the EPA, and on any of their contamination things, they have uh, uh, information that talks about uh, the effects uh, like chlorine's uh, eyes and nose irritant, but they'll have a, a maximum level, uh, four parts per million, um, called a maximum residual disinfectant level uh, that public water supplies must stay under. Um, Another thing besides the effects of chlorine itself, the um, chlorination can cause disinfection byproducts for community water supplies. 
but typically these aren't problems for people on private wells because when you do this chlorination that Steve was just talking about, you're typically letting it sit overnight and then you're flushing all that chlorinated water uh, out to waste. And so the stuff, the, the intent there is to, to kill the microbes uh, with that shock chlorination and then you shouldn't really need to do that uh, on a continuous basis. Um, so generally speaking, you're not gonna really going to have a, a residual amount of chlorine like uh, municipal water supplies. Um, if you are on a continuous chlorination system, then you have other then you have these other things that you'll want to be thinking about. Um, but uh, the one point here is the there is always a, a minimum level. Like the the maximum level is four parts per million. Uh, generally, you're probably going to see recommendations somewhere between 0.2 and two parts per million for a residual chlorine level. But most people are probably not going to need a, the continuous system. And for the most part, with this disinfection questions, it's it's uh, not generally something you're going to need to worry about. Great. Sorry about that. Uh, oh, no, that's all right. Uh, okay, yeah, the next question was was similar, uh, had to do with chlorination and disinfection um, and sanitation of a cistern. And we don't really uh, deal with cisterns in this class. Um, sometimes I've had people ask me how to uh, treat cistern water and how to store cistern water. And so this is sort of related. And we've used these, um, rather than me reinventing uh, the answer, I like to just refer people to a, a nice link that CDC has. And there's a, there's a page here at um, the Arizona Extension Office that's, that's listed on the site uh, that talk about storage and uh, uh, this exact question, I think, how to sanitize the cistern. There's a process. Essentially, it mean, it's, it's similar to sanitizing a well. It's, uh, you're going to uh, put a certain amount of dosage of, of chlorine in there, you're going to let it sit, then you're going to empty it, flush it all away, and then uh, uh, rent, you know, fill it up again. Um, I think in the case of a cistern where you've got a uh, storage water, it's, it's standing there for a long period of time, uh, they're going to have you add, like the previous slide, uh, a small amount of chlorine, about 0.2%. I think it's, they'll say 0.2 to 2%, uh, just to maintain that residual amount in the cistern. But follow those links for the best advice. Yeah, and again, anyone who wants uh, these slides, we'll make a PDF of them available after the meeting, or after the webinar. So um, you can get access at least to these links that way. Okay, um, so in this question, someone who's uh, has emailed me a couple times uh, in preparation for this webinar, and so... Um, it's really, it really gets to a lot of issues, so I wanted to talk about it. And I know it's already 2.30, but if you'll bear with, um, I think there's only a couple more questions. And then we do have a few from uh, folks on the call today. Um, we have a 362-foot bedrock well with 62 feet of casing. So that, so after 62 feet, it's just an open hole. Um, with the static water level of 138 feet and a pumping water level of 235 feet, and I may have misread that because uh, in our correspondence, even the few minutes before the webinar started, uh, he talked about having the pump at 140 feet, so that can't quite be right based on the first conversation we had. But it's a good example. So we are now having sediment issues, and the driller said it could occur because of high iron and excessive rain. Can you discuss grout encasing and screen issues that can affect why this is occurring? Okay, so there's really a lot to unwrap here, which is why I wanted to talk about it. One is where's the pump set? So if it's 360 foot, two foot deep, I guess the, the driller told them that maybe raising the pump would help uh, if they have a sediment problem, but that should only be if um, if they haven't had it all along, then it can't just be that the pump's in the wrong spot and if unless it's really deep. If the, if the pump's near the bottom, within, say, five feet of the bottom, then certainly it could stir up any sediment that's dropped to the bottom of the well, and so then it would make sense. Um, but if the pump is really up in the hundreds of feet and it's 360 feet, two feet deep, um, it's very unlikely that it's because of where the pump's at. High iron, it should have been an issue since day one. So if it has been, um, you know, and they're precipitating it, if you have high iron, as soon as it hits air, it precipitates out. That's why you get the rusty color on your sinks and all those sorts of things. But um, it shouldn't be anything new. And there has been a lot of rain in many parts of the country this spring. Uh, and so if if it is excessive rain, then the fact that they only have 62 feet of casing probably it could be two things. One, it could be that the grout around their casing 
uh, which is the what you you know the clay you put in or cement you put in between the well casing and the well bore, which is a bigger hole so you can get the casing down in it, isn't sealed properly. So all this rain, some of it's been going around down. It's called the annulus, which is the area uh, between the casing and the well bore. It's been going down the annulus and it's causing sediment problems because there's soil material getting down there. The other is that um, if they're in the right type of bedrock geology like karst, then there's natural caverns and sinkholes and 62 feet of casing may not just be enough, And uh, but that should have also been happening since day one. So if it's a grout failure issue, um, you know, that's one thing, but if it's a karst topography and karst geology, then there's probably not a lot you can do except that casing should be extended a lot further. Um, so going back to a bedrock well, you know, where the casing is, water is not getting in the well, it's solid. And when you seat the casing, the bottom of the casing into the bedrock, below that it's just the borehole that you drilled through the rock. So the rock acts as the casing, and every time you run into a fracture, that lets water into that borehole so that water can be pumped up through your well. And so if you case the whole thing off, then you're casing off the fractures, and you won't, may not have enough water supply. So um, one of the things I want to mention is um, we had a, a guy from uh, the state of North Carolina speak at our conference last week. His name is Wilson Mize. He has a camera and he goes around and diagnoses problems. And a couple of videos he showed were just simply amazing. Even with 60 or 80 feet of casing, um, when the camera gets down to where the casing stops and the rock starts, you can see water pouring in the well. And this was in North Carolina. But um, there's just so much you can learn having a camera, and if you're able to diagnose it or get a, um, someone with a downhole camera to uh, take video of your well, you're a lot more likely to figure out what's going on. And that's, I know that, that could be, uh, you know, I think he said in North Carolina it costs 250 to $400 to have that done, and certainly that's an expense. Um, but I know for, for my sake, um, I'm going to buy one. Uh, for us to use here. Uh, we don't do a lot of diagnosis of wells, but we can make it available to others. And it's um, it's just when you, if you watch these videos, which in a couple months when all these talks are up online, you should be able to watch these videos. Um, it's just amazing how much information you gather by being able to see what's going on down in the well. And so uh, for this particular situation, you know, it could be a casing grout issue um, you know, talking to them further, they've had, uh, they have a filter and uh, a five micron filter on their system, and it's always had uh, some sediment and stuff, but that's typical because you've got native rock down there and all that stuff. So um, I don't know that we know the answer, but it, it could be uh, a grout issue or it could be the geology part of that issue, but I don't think it's the pump issue because the well's so deep. So um, that's how I answer that question. <laughs> Um, a couple other ones. Is there a residential well density threshold, or does it vary by geology? You know, we've never been asked that question, but it's a really good one. So it really does depend on geology and well yield, and uh, meaning that uh, if you're in a large sand and gravel aquifer, you could probably have, you know, 20 wells all within 20 or 30 feet of each other, and they all be able to pump enough water for a private water supply. Um, whereas if you're in a low yielding bedrock, two wells in the same fracture could uh, cause both of them uh, to not have enough uh, water to be available. And uh, we see wells that are very low yielding, uh, maybe less than two gallons a minute, where when they pump their well, they're dropping the water level in their well 700 feet. And uh, that's just from one well. So it, it, it's totally dependent on that. Um, and uh, I would talk to your state geological survey about the area you're in, and they should be able to give you some information um, they've mapped the geology in your state. They should have some idea of uh, if there's going to be a problem with well density in a given area. Now, you see subdivisions with a well at every house. Uh, those are a lot of times maybe there's two wells within 25 or 30 feet of each other, even if they're not supposed to be by code, um, things like that, and there's not a problem. In other areas, you see one well for every five or seven houses, not because the contractor is trying to be cheap, but because you can't put more wells there without having uh, well competition or conflicting 
uh, problems. You know, how deep do you set the pump? Well, if my neighbor's at 180 feet, I'm going to put mine at 190. Well, then he lowers his to 200. So, um, and another question we've never got, which is a great question, is why is there a vent on a well cap? You know, we talk about having a sanitary seal and having it sealed properly and everything else. Well, in a lot of areas, you really need a vent cap because it causes the the air in the well above the water level to be at atmospheric pressure. And when you pump a well, you're lowering the water level, and then the atmospheric pressure is pushing down to the water surface. If you had no vent on there and it was completely sealed, airtight, you create a vacuum. And if it draws it down enough, one, it's going to make your pump work a lot harder, and two, it could even uh, cave in or uh, cause problems with uh, even suck in, um, I've never seen this, but, you know, a rubber seal or something like that because it's going to create a lot of pressure uh, difference between uh, uh, in the well because it's, you know, it's like you're trying to, uh, it's, yeah. So uh, good question. And so um, don't go anywhere because we do have a few other questions. Um, let me um, pop this down and pull this over, and uh, we'll go with that. Let me make this bigger if I can, if I figure out how to do this. There we go. Okay. So, given a positive coliform test at the kitchen sink and a negative test from an outside spigot, what are the health hazards? In other words, if the coliform problem is only in the distribution system, what are the potential health dangers? Thanks. So, you can't go by that. Uh, on a one-time test. It could be that there was something on, um, you know, there's whole classes on how to collect a water sample, but some people even suggest removing the end of your uh, uh, sink uh, nozzle thing uh, because it can cause a coliform hit if, if it's got a screen in it. Um, and Dan, maybe you want to speak to this more. You're probably more aware of it. But if the outside spigot doesn't have a hit, uh, and your inside one does, the first thing to do would be to disinfect your system, and then they should both not have one, uh, right? Yeah, I, I think so. You know, I've talked to, sometimes it sort of depends on the hit. Uh, we had somebody working with us who, who did a lot of this testing before, and like if you get a one colony count, something that's just barely above it, I think it would probably be a good idea just to verify that. Like Steve said, you know, it might be, Something sometimes you know a little bit different handling can affect things. Like if it's if it's unscrewing the aerator, or I think some instructions might say uh, wipe it down, wipe your tap down with alcohol first, and then uh, you know to kill anything there, and then let the water run. Not using don't use the alcohol in the sample, but uh, so there might be, there might be reasons that were caused by the sampling, but um, generally if this stays true, um, yeah I. I you know, if it is something that happened to grow inside your house, I think I would treat it like I would any positive coliform test and, and disinfect. Um, yeah. be, because the disinfection process, is, you should be running it not just at your well and, and, and up to your pressure tank. You should run all the taps in all your house so you can smell chlorine coming out. And so the theory would go that you would, you know, kill off any of those colonies. I, seem reasonable, Steve? Or? No, yeah, exactly right. And, and when you disinfect, it, it, it is... Every toilet, shower, anything where water can run out, you should run them until you smell chlorine and let it sit at least overnight. And, um, you know, that's it's that contact time uh, with the chlorinated water that's going to kill those things. And if it is like in the screen uh, that's in your uh, kitchen sink uh, tap, um, you know, the, if, if that keeps being a problem, that could be the cause. And sure. you know, maybe you take that off and uh, take another sample that way. So, when our hopefully the wherever you get the test, they'll give you some instructions that maybe explain some of those things. I think our local health department has some pretty good instructions that that cover a lot of that, like a full page that tell you things to look out for. Yeah, and you know one thing we haven't done, and uh, just uh, talking out loud, I know um, the MAP uh, Midwest Assistance Program person for RCAP. Um, actually gives a presentation on how to collect a, a, a sample because it's not just a problem for doing that for yourself for a private well or as a health professional. 
but it's a problem for water operators when they're collecting their monthly samples for compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act. And so uh, it's a really good um, presentation on, you know, things that you should do to make sure that you're not contaminating your sample. And, and that's actually why I thought of the screen that's in uh, your your tap is because I, I participate in one of those recently. We should really look into developing uh, or finding those materials and, and providing them here. Um, yeah, so we are finding PFAs uh, in more water supplies near Air Force bases and airports. Is RCAP looking into this huge problem? Well, I, I can't say that RCAP is looking into this directly. Um, you know, a lot of us are um, looking at what's going on both through I, ITRC, the Interstate Technology Regulatory Commission, has a work group looking at best practices for PFAs. Um, and we actually had that person come talk at our conference as well, so there'll be a, vi a video available for that pretty soon. But it's not something that's readily, uh, it's not easy to detect and it's expensive. And so it's not a common uh, constituent that anyone's testing for. When we get calls from uh, people who live near uh, any kind of airport or Air Force base, um, and they ask that question, we refer them to their local health department because they probably do need to test. I mean, it's, you know, what we learned last week is uh, it's very mobile in the environment and it's very persistent. There are hundreds of uh, different formulations of, P of PFAs. Uh, many of them don't cause problems, but there are a few that do. And so, um, and it's, you know, they can cause health effects down to the tr trillionth level, right? Less than, um, I think the EPA is going to move forward with recommended uh, 70 parts per trillion for just the four main ones, I think, together. And so um, RCAP, you know, is a, a more of an education and uh, technical assistance type program. They don't have labs. They don't, um, aren't out there testing everywhere, um, but they are getting well owners in contact with who they need to for that. And there's a lot of labs that are still gearing up the capability. And I know they're still even working on the methodology for what's going to be uh, eventually the you know the, the approved EPA method for PFA detect for PFAS detection, so it's you know we know it's a huge problem. There's a lot going on now in a lot of different realms related to it. Um, you know equipment being tested and everything else to remove it, and they do know there's. I mean, I can't tell you offhand. I'd have to look, um, but you know they do know how to remove it from water. So um, there'll be treatment equipment for it. I'm sure soon. So. Um, but it is a huge problem, no doubt. Um, so the third question here is, uh, where can we find the assessment tool? And Katie's provided the answer. If you just go to privateoldclass.org slash assessment, uh, there's a link there to the actual PDF. It's a fillable PDF. Um, and then also to the um, tablet versions. And again, um, we are trying to finalize a guide that walks through um, all the different potential answers related to each of these. So between the check boxes and all the boxes you can fill out and everything else, there are 430 some elements in this tool. So it is uh, quite extensive. And again, um, you know, it, it, you need to have some wherewithal in order to use it really. And uh, you know, we've had people ask us, well, why don't you just make a simple one that's one or two pages? Well, if you did that, you wouldn't really get to the issues that most well owners need you to get to. And the idea is we're giving them better advice if we're getting more complete information. And so um, that's the approach we've taken. Just like the class, you know, 99% of the well owners who contact me want me to solve their problem for them, um, quick and dirty. I have this issue. I'm only calling because I had a problem, not because I'm interested in learning more about my well. And um, our class isn't built that way. It's 86 pages total. It's meant to be a comprehensive class that will teach you how to take care of your well. And many times I refer people to that and just say, well, you know, in lesson five it talks about that. You really need to take a class um, because I'm not helping them if I'm just giving them an answer most of the time. So, and number four, when well, well casing is only 50 feet deep but the well is 200 feet deep, is the 150 feet difference between the casing and the well depth simply a storage for water to be used in the house? Um, no. So, uh, the reason is bedrock isn't porous like sand and gravel. You know, sand and gravel is up to 30% air. If I had a jar of sand, 
uh, 30% of that jar is actually still air. And an aquifer is when that's full of water. So an example I used earlier, if um, we have an aquifer that's 100 feet thick of sand and gravel, that means 70, per, 70 feet of it is actually sand and the other 30 feet is water uh, by volume. So um, there's a lot of water available. But in a bedrock well, the rock itself doesn't have space for water. The water exists in fractures in the rock. So depending on how many fractures you have and how big the fractures are, kind of depends on um, and, and how interconnected they are, dictates how much water is available at that well at that location. So when you drill a well in bedrock, you put the casing down as far as you need to to be safe, and then the rest of the hole is drilled as an open hole so that every time you hit a fracture, that fracture has access. The water in that fracture can get into the borehole. And then when you pump your well, it, it draws water in. And so that's why you don't case the entire thing. Um, in some cases, there might be a sandstone that uh, is very friable and it will cause a lot of sand to get in your pump and things like that. And in those cases, they may use uh, either slots, uh, cut slots in the steel uh, casing, or actually use a lot of screen so that they can keep that out. But that's a, just a particular occurrence. Um, so then, what is the reason the depth? Uh, is water being drawn out of the bottom of the well depth or at the bottom of the casing depth? So the water is being drawn from the pump, right? Wherever that pump set, um, but where the water's coming from is coming from the fractures. And it could be that you drilled 200 feet and there's only three fractures and they're between 50 feet and 100 feet. That means all the water in the well is coming from those three fractures that are shallower than your well. Um, it could be that um, you drilled down to 200 feet because you hit five feet of sandstone and it's all you know, open and available and all the water's coming from the bottom. It, it really depends on the well in individual case. Um, as an example, in Kankakee County, Illinois, I did my graduate work there. Um, there's a lot of irrigation wells where they can pump up to 1,500 gallons a minute, even though it's bedrock, because there's several really large fractures that are all interconnected. So um, the farmers there know uh, they can look at a map and see a line where all the wells are that are hitting those fractures, and they try to drill on the fracture line so they make sure and, and hit one of those fractures and they have plenty of water available. One of the farmers when I was up there, and this is in the 80s, um, said he had a well he called his Cadillac well because he spent over $50,000 drilling it and uh, in the end he missed all the fractures and they kept drilling and rock becomes more solid typically as you go deeper. He drilled almost 600 feet where most of the wells are in the 250s to 300 range there and the most water he could get out of the well was uh, about 30 gallons a minute, which isn't enough for irrigation uh, because he missed all of those fractures. So it's really about hitting fractures. That uh, It's like a pipe system underground that allows all the water to move freely between you know, the big sections of rock, and that's uh, where that comes from. Okay, um, I think that's the last question. Uh, and so I'll put this up. If you're looking for CEs, you can email us, and if you have any other questions or comments, feel free to email uh, at this email address, or I know uh, when you get the follow-up tomorrow, it'll have mine. That's fine, too. Um, we appreciate everyone's time, and uh, hopefully this was helpful. So thank you, and everyone uh, have a great rest of your week.